G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy after what has been probably yeah, a good couple of weeks without making any videos. Hope you guys have been well. Wish I could say that I've been up to something interesting over the last couple of weeks, but frankly, I've just been doing absolutely bugger all. Uh, but I thought I'd dust off the camera for today's video to come up with a first attempt at a bit of a mock draft for the upcoming draft, which takes place on Wednesday, the 25th of November, if I'm not mistaken, might be the 24th. Uh, it's a two day event. And then the Thursday is the second half of the draft as well. So how's it going? to work this year is like most years it's going to be a two-day event i think last year they did cut it back to one but it's back to the two-day format where the first day is going to be the first round so the top 18 or 20 picks i'm not sure exactly how they're going to split it and then the second day there's going to be a little bit of a trade period i think a 45 minute trade period where teams can trade picks which seems a little redundant considering you can trade picks throughout the draft anyway then after that 45 minute trade period there's going to be uh, the, the rest of the draft so from round two to the end of round five or six or whenever it ends so in today's video i'm going to rattle through my current top 20 i think bush and i may attempt a uh, maybe a top 30 or top 40 on a podcast um you know in the next week or so i'm not too sure exactly when we're going to do it but we will do it so this is my first crack now it may seem redundant to do more than one mock draft but honestly between now and the actual draft happening in a couple of weeks time there's going to be so much late mail so much news and rumors that clubs are considering different players with picks that it's still a fun exercise to do one now and also one right before the draft as well but anyway without rattling on too much i'm going to get straight into my draft i'm going to start off with pick one and then move all the way down to pick 20. So North Melbourne has pick one in this draft and I'm going to take Jason Horn Francis, probably the least surprising pick or one of about three least surprising picks you could find in a phantom draft. North Melbourne have pretty much committed to taking Horn Francis. He's an 184 centimeter sort of midfield forward explosive kind of player compared to sort of like a smaller danger field or even a Toby Green, which is strange because those are two quite different players, but it's obviously every player is unique. He's not exactly like either one of those guys, but regardless, an absolute game breaking midfielder forward who has been playing against men and playing really well. I think he had like three goals and 20 odd touches in the in the prelim final for the, the men's side. So we're talking about a kid who can come in and impact from day one and is likely to have a bit of marketability as well. So it really adds something North Melbourne don't have to what is already a pretty good young list. There's not too much doubt here. North Melbourne are going to take Horn Francis with pick one and not necessarily bid on any other players, I don't think. GWS have pick two, but I think this will come in the form of a bid on Nick Dacos, who is considered by some to be the best player in this draft, but unanimously He's certainly a top two player. It seems like Dacos and Horn Francis are on their own kind of level in this particular draft. He's kind of an inside outside accumulating mid who will find plenty of the ball. I think he averaged like 35 possessions and two goals a game in the NAB League this year from the footy that he did play. So his production is outstanding and he'll hits the scoreboard as well. I think Nightmare compared him to Zach Merritt, but sounds like he has a bit more scoreboard impact as well. So we're talking about a guy who could genuinely be, you know, a top five to 10 midfielder of the comp. So Collingwood will undoubtedly match this bid. They're going to, they've committed to it. I think they've already offered him a four-year contract as well. So with pick two, let's lock in Collingwood, take Nick Dacos. Given the Giants need four key position forwards, they're also going to bid on the Bulldogs' Sam Darcy with pick three. So that means Sam Darcy will join the Western Bulldogs as a father-son, son of Luke, if you weren't already aware. Darcy's considered the, certainly the far and away best key position forward in this year's draft. He's sort of compared to the King Twins. He's really oversized, well, not oversized in the modern game, but as far as key forwards go, 204, 205 centimeters, that, you know, that's a very, very very big key forward. His father was a ruckman and it seems like he can do a bit of rucking, but generally his position is a key forward. So two years in a row, the Bulldogs have taken the best forward in each draft, adding Darcy to Jamara Ugelhagen and adding to what is a very formidable looking young list at the Western Bulldogs. So finally, GWS have their own live pick. This was originally Collingwood's pick two, but now GWS hold it and they are going to take their first live pick of the draft. And I think I'm going to go with a needs based pick here. Finn Callahan's probably the best available player, but as a midfielder, not sure he's necessarily number one on their list in terms of what they need. So I'm actually going to pull the trigger on Josh Gibkiss, who is a kind of a divisive sort of key position defender here. Considered fairly unanimously the best key position defender in the draft and certainly the most likely to go in the top 10. His range seems to be, you know, if he doesn't go at pick four, he could slide into the middle to late teens, it seems. But I think there's a few teams, in particular Gold Coast and GWS, who have a need for a key back. So I'm going to say with GWS, you know, Phil Davis coming to the end of his career, 
We're going to add Gibkiss to Sam Taylor, who we're going to partner up to be their backline for the next 10 years. At pick five, we have the Gold Coast Suns, who I would have been lining up to take Josh Gibkiss, but I think the Giants will just pull the trigger on him as well. There's a bit of a lack of key defensive talent around that top five to 10 range as well. So as such, I think the Gold Coast Suns are going to go best available. And despite not really needing a midfielder, I think they're going to take Finn Callahan purely based on the talent that he presents. He's a really strong outside predominantly, but fairly decent inside sort of midfielder. He's big bodied, he's explosive of his skillful and regardless of the fact they don't need midfielders he certainly does add a bit of a point of difference to guys like Anderson and Raul already in that young midfield as well and it took Miller as well sometimes you just got to take best available and I think Finn Callahan is that at pick six we've got the Adelaide Crows and this is a tougher one because as far as I'm aware their needs are probably going to be sort of you know just sort of a midfielder with a point of difference they've got some decent youth there but no one to really stand out as that match winner and I think that's why they went so hard at a Horn Francis but I did seriously consider someone like a Josh Ward as a midfield option for them, but with their history of retention issues and with Ward being rumored to say he doesn't want to leave Victoria, I think they might go conservative on this pick. One player that they've been linked to is Josh Rochelle, another one of those players that's been compared to Toby Green, but seems like more of an actual forward rather than someone who can rotate through the midfielder, but a very, very good ball user, very, very skillful and can certainly turn a game for Adelaide. So he's certainly got a bit of a point of difference. I think Adelaide have been linked to him, so I think they're going to pull the trigger at pick six on Rochelle. At pick seven, we have got a Hawthorne footy club club and they'll be looking at probably a midfielder with this pick and it's a tough one because you've got Hobbs and Ward available but I, I'm going to pull a bit of a smoky here and I'm going to say Hawthorne take the punt on Matthew Johnson from Western Australia. This is a little bit earlier than people might have been expecting a pick for him. I think Toomey did actually say Hawthorne were considering him with this pick and that's probably influencing me a little bit here but he's a really big bodied 192 centimeter inside midfielder compared to a taller sort of Scott Pendlebury and Scott Pendlebury is a pretty tall midfielder as well. Could feel out to be that sort of Bontempelli size as well. So I'm going to say Hawthorne sort of buck expectations here and they go for Matthew Johnson for a point of difference. Next up, we have Fremantle with pick eight who might have been looking at Matthew Johnson as the best available midfielder. And it kind of leaves him with the awkward situation of looking at a Josh Ward and a Ben Hobbs as the next two best available midfielders, it would seem. Bearing in mind, they did just lose Adam Chera and yes, they recruited Will Brody and Jordan Clark, but neither of those guys are really as talented as Adam Chera, you would have to say. So I, I think they'll replenish their list with a midfielder. In terms of skill set, I don't know if Hobbs really stands out to them. He may be the best available on talent, but with guys like Brayshaw and Sarong already in that side as sort of nuggety inside mids as well, I don't know if he is the best fit for them. So I'm going to say they take a massive risk and draft Josh Ward here. It's a massive risk because they're a team with retention issues and is a player that says he might want to have stayed in Victoria, but Fremantle tend to just go best available anyway. And I think they'll back themselves in to try and change his mind. They've got a plenty of young Victorians on that list as well who can help retain him. I could be wrong here and I, I could be misreading this completely, but I think Fremantle pull the trigger on Josh Ward. I think he's a little bit too good to let slip past this. Now we have Richmond at pick nine and I think they're going to pull the trigger on Ben Hobbs as the best available midfielder. He's been sort of compared to kind of a Joel Selwood type, a very aggressive inside midfielder who can win the footy at the coalface. For me, I think Richmond just needs to replenish their midfielder. So it's a case of best available. He's the homegrown talent. I think without too much consideration, Richmond take Ben Hobbs with this pick. At pick number 10, Fremantle have been continually linked to Jai Amos, but I'm not too sure if they're necessarily going to pull the trigger on a guy that probably isn't actually rated a top 10 talent, other than the fact that he's from WA and Fremantle do need a key forward talent. But again, I'm not too convinced Fremantle will be thinking along the same sort of lines. They do tend to just pick best available. As such, I think they're going to take Neil Erasmus, sort of a half forward who's developed into that midfield role. He's a very big bodied player, 188 centimeters at the moment, probably will grow uh, past 190, you would think. Been compared to an Elliot Yo, perhaps without the same kind of level of explosive speed, but also probably better forward utility as well, because he did used to be a genuine medium forward as well. So again, a point of difference, Fremantle pick a midfielder that can genuinely play forward, which is probably something they don't have on their list already. St Kilda's pick here is interesting. I had originally thought they would be lining up a Hobbs or a Ward for this pick or even an Erasmus, but with those three going in consecutive picks before them, I think they're in a position to take a bit of a risk on Mac Andrew. With Paddy Ryder coming towards the end of his career, they need a long-term partner for Rowan Marshall, who's still young and just sort of entering his prime, really. I don't think the Ruck solution is completely ticked off at St Kilda, so I think it's a good time to draft a longer-term prospect in Mac Andrew, who's going to take a few years to get ready anyway in terms of filling out but he's a really really athletic he's lightly built but over time you'd think he'd fill out and really presents as a really unique sort of prospect in this upcoming draft so I think St Kilda I think they're in a position to take a bit more of a risky pick here and draft a 
longer term project player with pick 11. At pick 12, we got the West Coast Eagles and this is interesting picking it from a fan's perspective. I think everyone wants us to take Johnson or Erasmus as the best available WA talents. But in this particular draft, I've got all of those guys missing. I don't think we're necessarily above picking a key position player if we think he's the best available with Josh Kennedy going to be retiring in 12 months. That being said, I'm not going to tease that too much further. I'm going to go with my first reach of the draft and I think the Eagles might just pluck an Arlo Draper at pick 12. A few others I considered were Van Royen, a Wanganin Miller as well, a Josh Sin in particular too. But I do think the Eagles have a bit of a tendency to like their forward half players. Arlo Draper is sort of like a taller forward half medium forward who apparently could play in the midfield longer term, but Nightmare compares him to Robbie Gray. And I just think West Coast do like their players who can play multiple positions, but also be a bit of an X factor in the forward half of the ground. And you look at the last two first rounders we took in Venables and Brander, both of them were forward half players, neither of them on the list anymore. I just I generally think the Eagles will just surprise people and I think Arlo Draper might be the one we take. Let's move on to Essendon here who are going to pounce on Naziah Wanganin Malira. He's 188 centimeter, lightly built, 71 kilo sort of midfield utility. He's got really, really good skills and good speed. And again, a pretty unique prospect at this part of the draft. Essendon are obviously coming off the back of a very strong draft last year and taking Nick Cox and Perkins as well as a Zach Reed. I think they're in a position to take a different sort of player again as a Wanganin Miller who I think will start his career as a back half sort of player who can use the ball well out of defense. I think the Bombers will be wrapped to take him at pick 13. At pick 14, we have the Port Adelaide Footy Club who are a tough team to draft for. They've drafted heavily over the last few years, taken some really, really good talents. Looking at their list, there's no glaring weaknesses as such. So I think they can probably just take best available. But for me, I'm thinking they might look at a longer term sort of key back solution. Obviously just traded in Alir Alir who is quite young and in his prime. But when Tom Jonas eventually retires, they'll want to have had a key position player in the back half who has had a couple of years of development. So it's a long-winded way of saying I think they might pounce on Claremont's Jacob Van Ruin. Van Ruin had a fantastic year for Claremont and in particular showed he's a big game player with some good performances for both Western Australia against South Australia and also Claremont in the grand final. He's predominantly a key position defender but also showed some pretty good utility when he played forward as well. So in a similar vein to how Port Adelaide plucked the West Australian Georgiatis a couple of years ago, I think they're going to go a little bit early on Van Ruin and I think they're going to be very happy with it. At pick 15, we have GWS re-entering the draft with the second pick that they're going to have. And I'm going to say they go for a needs-based selection and take Jai Amos from East Perth. Bearing in mind, they did take Gibkiss with their first pick in this particular mock draft. I think the young midfield is pretty good. I think they really lack scoring power in terms of, well, both their best 22 right now, but also longer term in terms of their young talent as well. Jesse Hogan may come on. Riccardi also looked likely a couple of years ago, but with Finn Lason joining Port Adelaide, I think Jai Amos is probably a need needs based selection and at pick 15 probably best available as well and he kicked 51 goals from 15 games this year as well and he's deadly accurate so he's a country boy who had to travel to train and play this year as well so there's a bit of a suggestion there is a developmental upside with Amos as well and he could present as that genuine key forward prospect but at the very least it seems like a Jack Gunston type as well which I think GWS would welcome. Pick 16 we've got the Brisbane Lions entering their draft and they've got pick 16 here and also pick 19 coming up as well so they've got a couple of bites at the Apple. They've been linked to some run and dash in the back half. And I think the best available talent on that basis is Josh Sin from Victoria. He's a very, very quick, very skillful and very attacking sort of player in that back half. And supposedly was considered a top five prospect at the start of the year and had some bad luck with injury and hasn't really shown that he can play in the midfield just yet, according to Nightmare. However, just from a needs basis, I think the Lions could stand to take a genuine halfback flanker. And I think he's a very, very good one too. I'd be very happy if the Eagles took him at pick 12. So I think the Lions will be happy at pick 16 to pick 17 we've got another club taking their second pick of this draft and it's Richmond who again can look to more of a needs basis and I think they might actually well I was going to say reach but by some estimations this is not a reach at all but I think they're going to take Leek Alia as a South Australian key defensive player he's a really really athletic intercept player compared to Alia Alia who is kind of a namesake it's spelled differently but Nightmare does rank him in the top 10 of his power rankings or at least he did at the time of me releasing this video. He's actually rated him higher than Gibkiss as well, and I know Elia generally has his fans, so I think Richmond, with their bevy of picks in the 20s and 30s, they can stand to take a bit more of a reach pick, and as such, I think they'll be happy adding Leek Elia to Ben Hobbs at pick 9. At pick 18, we have the Sydney Swans entering the draft for the first time in this draft, and it's kind of hard to pick their needs. They just traded in Laddam, so their ruck solution is kind of there. They've been linked to needing a key position defender, but I'm not too sure if they'll leap on a Rhett Bazo 
at this particular pick. I think it's a little bit early. I think they might just look at what their midfield kind of lacks in terms of a point of difference. I think that's a big bodied inside mid to replace Josh Kennedy. And I think they might pluck Mitch Nevitt here. Mitch Nevitt is an absolutely enormous midfielder standing at 194 centimeters. And you think he'd grow to about 196. So we're talking about a genuine Paddy Cripps style midfielder here. The Swans have some great youth in that midfield in particular as well. But I think Nevitt just stands out as a point of difference there. And you could see him slotting into that midfield of Florent, Mills, Heaney, Campbell, Warner, McInerney. They don't really have a tall bullocking player in the way that Mitch Nevitt is as well. So I think they'll take a needs-based pick and take Mitch Nevitt. With the second last pick of this draft, we've got the Brisbane Lions re-entering after just taking Josh Sin at pick 16. So they've already taken a halfback flanker. They're in a position to maybe take a best available pick, but I think they'll also look at kind of a needs-based pick here as well. And I think Josh Goto sort of ticks the box in both instances. The reason being he's a 190 centimeter sort of utility who has been really impressive from the footage that I've seen of him as a midfielder. He just hasn't quite proven that he can make that full transition just yet. He's kind of an intercepting defender as well as I understand it as well, but if he can hit his ceiling and move to the midfielder as well, he does present a big point of difference as well for the Lions for what they currently have as well, being so tall and so athletic. He's really explosive off the mark, really, really good agility, and his distribution by hand looks really solid as well. So a bit of a riskier one there, but I think Josh Goda could be a very good player for the Brisbane Lions. With the final pick of this Phantom Draft, pick 20, we've got the reigning Premier is the Melbourne Footy Club who traded back into the first round of this year's draft and it's unclear whether they have someone in particular in mind or if they simply just rate the top 20 of this year's draft. I think looking at their list, they're so well balanced. There's not really too many weaknesses, to be honest. I think they're just going to take the best available kid and for me, that's probably Tyler Sonzi. He's a smaller sort of bodied midfielder forward at 181 centimetres who is a very balanced midfielder, very dual-sided, so he can win the clearances and also hurt you on the outside with kicking on both of his feet. In addition to that, he's able to get forward and actually impact on the scoreboard as well. And I think Melbourne are sort of in this trend of liking their smaller players who can impact the scoreboard. As such, you can also see him slotting into the team and playing pretty early as well with his skill set. Anyway, guys, that is all I have for the top 20 of this mock draft. Let me know in the comments who you go for and who you want your team to pick and what you would have done differently in my shoes. And I'm sure most of you will disagree with what I've done, but it is really hard. And obviously I don't know every team's list needs extremely intimately. I think I've done a fairly solid job, but again, you know, the draft is so subjective and there's going to be a really big surprise on draft night in the first 20 selections and possibly the top 15 or 10 as well. But anyway, guys, thank you for watching. Hope you're all doing well and I'll see you in the next draft related video. Cheers.